welcome back to the Good Inspiration. Now, for our last round table, we're going to be talking about a subject that's very close to my heart as a futurist, the critical role of business in society. How are we going to use the resources and the energy from organizations for wider societal good? The theme of the panel is very apt, as you can see on screen. Business for society to be good or not to be. I think it's quite clever. Now, businesses are clearly essential players when it comes to architecting the future of societies, how we work, how we live. They have an impact on all realms of our life. And now more and more organizations are aware of their role in collective action. I think many of you will agree. And we've got new generations of the workforce within and outside organizations that are here to remind us that businesses need to be held accountable to act responsibly and that businesses need to start thinking like citizens. So how can we accelerate what we're calling the reinvention of businesses, the new shape and form that organizations will have to take to stay relevant in the future. And how will we then maintain this momentum to develop innovative and frugal solutions that are realistic and that actually work? For this last discussion, I have three incredibly special guests. I'm going to introduce them one by one. We have Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, who is chairman of the board of directors of Angie, appointed in May 2018. Prior to that, he was CEO and board member of Solvay between 2012 and 2019. And amongst a number of leadership positions, Jean-Pierre is also a member of the executive committee of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Please give a very warm welcome to Jean-Pierre. Thank you. Please. Right, our next person coming on stage is someone you may have heard earlier in the day if you were here. Ria Singhal is the founder and CEO of EcoWare, India's first and largest sustainability packaging company. She is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, and she was recently honored with the highest civilian honor that can be awarded in India by the President of India himself. Please join me in welcoming Ria Singhal. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Bertrand Picard. He is the initiator and world famous visionary behind Solar Impulse, the very first airplane capable of flying perpetually without fuel. That's a pretty mean feat. Today he is chairman of the Solar Impulse Foundation and rather than new territories, he wishes to discover new ways of thinking, particularly in the field of developing clean technologies for a better life. An apt fit for the panel, Bertrand Picard. Right, now before we start, I want to remind you that you're able to ask any questions you wish of our esteemed panel through the app. And they're going to come up live on the screen in front of me. But I want us to start this conversation by watching a short film. It contains testimonials from an initiative or may not have heard of, it's called 20 Questions to the World, where the creator set out to interview and film as many diverse individuals as possible to better understand humanity and really get that breadth of opinion. So let's listen to a few people tell us how they see the role of business to drive change. Cue film, please. Businesses are, you know, uh, to a great extent responsible for destroying the environment. I want to have a company about re reusing and recycling. Sería algo vinculado con 
con el medio ambiente. Sustainable technologies, por ejemplo, like things to do with permaculture and rainwater harvesting. Ce serait une entreprise qui construit des voitures. Sustainable living, company that would uh, help the environment at the same time, uh, especially uh, help the poor, give jobs to the poor. I think corporations increasingly know that they are citizens as well and that they need to design and, ta and take care of the products and impact they have. Individually we can all do our, our little bit, but together um, and with corporates that are global, they're going to have much more significant uh, impact. Right, so we heard a little bit there as well of thoughts that allude a little bit to conscious capitalism, right? Is capitalism truly capable of reinventing itself, Petro? I believe that if we are in such a trouble today, it's because we are not doing real capitalism. In the real capitalism, people take care of their assets. And today we are destroying the assets of nature. In the real capitalism, we try to be more open to have more customers. And today we leave half of the world in poverty in a state where people cannot become customers. So we are selfish, we are irresponsible, and this is not the way to make good business. So I think it's not a question of reinventing capitalism, it's a question of doing real capitalism and not the crazy way our world has become. Jean-Pierre, I'd love to hear your views on that. No, as you will see in, uh, in this panel, I'm a pretty optimistic person. So yes, I think capitalism has the ability to transform itself in a way which is aligned with the uh, sustainable objectives that we probably all share in, uh, in this room. But there's a need for some significant adjustment in some areas. Uh, going from a very short-term vision to a longer-term one, this echo very well what Bertrand was, uh, was just saying. I tend to think that when we take a mid to long term approach, we see a strong alignment between our various types of objectives. The idea also of putting a price on a number of externalities, carbon being uh, the most obvious of them, this is a way to help capitalism adjust. And what capitalism is good at is allocating resources in a very efficient way making sure that we put our money in the project which have the best payback. So yes, I think capitalism has the ability to help us through the very significant transition in which we are today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And using our resources and indeed channelizing them in better ways. Ria, what's your take on that, particularly, for example, in the operating model of having to work and found a company in India where it's a different model and dynamic. It's just a different beast every time you go to a different country, isn't it? Absolutely, but um, it is, but I do believe that there are you know, key values that can help you with this. So you know, you're a conscious leader, you build that conscious culture uh, internally and externally, um, and uh, you, know, you, you communicate this higher purpose that you want to achieve basically um, with all your stakeholders. So I think fundamentally those are the things that will help you whether, whichever part of the world you're in. Yeah. And the role of the, it sounds like the role of the socially responsible leader, someone who is able to communicate then to all stakeholders, citizens, users, B2B, B2C, no matter what perhaps stakeholder that you actually serve, but to be able to make that very, very clear. Jean-Pierre, are we seeing perhaps then a new form of leadership that we need in different organizations? Oh, sure. I think that today we need different leaders than what we used to see uh, some decades ago. People who are able to have a much more comprehensive view of what's the objective of a company like Engie, making sure we don't just focus on financial uh, performance, but we take really a, a very broad view. We need people who understand the trends which will come, the world is changing uh, incredibly fast and if you think of energy, I think the world of energy has transformed itself incredibly quickly. So we need leaders who are also visionaries and leaders who can transform. We mm -hmm. need to transform ourselves. I don't know any CEO or any chairman who would not tell me I'm in the middle of a very significant yeah. transformation. So reinventing so ourselves. So we need to reinvent yes. ourselves, our business model, we need to reinvent the way we uh, 
align our resources within the organization. We need to reinvent the way we interact with customers. So yes, indeed, we are very demanding now when it comes to leadership. Yeah. We need people who can lead the way and make sure that we can achieve these transformations. Petro? It's not only a question of having new leaders, it's a question of having leaders instead of having managers. Because very often the big companies are run by managers and this is safe. They don't need to have a vision. They just do the day-to-day -day business and nobody can disagree. But when you have a leader, it's very difficult. It's very difficult when you look at NG, who is completely transforming its business model. Externally and internally, you have people who say, it's impossible, we cannot do that. They start to criticize. So I admire the leaders because they have the courage to put into action what they deeply believe. And this is what we need today. Absolutely. And actually, the question that's coming live on the app, I don't know who sent it through, but it's a very provocative one. And I believe what they're asking is perhaps to name some of the champions that you personally believe you would hold in good light who are actually paving the way towards sustainable leadership, present company included. Who wants to take that? Well, I, I can take that. I mean, uh, an obvious example, and uh, she happens to be sitting on the first row of this panel, uh, Isabel, uh, Isabel Cocher, I think, uh, as the CEO of NG, had the ability to understand the trends which were coming. And today it seems pretty obvious when we say energy transition or the transition towards zero carbon is key. Five years ago, much less obvious. So she clearly set the direction and she was able to bring uh, all the resources and the teams of NG together. And uh, if you have the time to visit uh, this setup today, this is very impressive to see what NG is able to offer. So clearly this was not something uh, of use some years ago. So yes, we have actual leaders who demonstrate this ability. Yes, and indeed, if I may say so myself, speaking for Ria and myself, we need more female business leaders as well. So for me, that's very heartening to see someone that is driving change rather than watching from the sidelines. We need much more of that. So kudos on that. Petro, in your work, would you say you've come across a couple of people that have really moved you, inspired you, that you think they're moving in the right direction? Fortunately, yes. <laughs> I'd be worried if you said you no. Have, you, you have two things. You have the people who act by passion, by values, and you see it in the business, as Jean-Pierre has very well said. You see it in politics also. When you see the king of Morocco, who is setting the goal of having 52% renewable energy in 2030, not 2050 when nobody will be there to control, but 2030, this is courageous. When you have the governor of California, who is setting the goal of being 100% renewables in 2040, when you have countries like Sweden, who introduce a very high carbon tax, 125 euros per ton of CO2, and it helps the companies to be more competitive, more efficient, and make more money even for exports, you see that they are leaders and they, they find a good way. But now there is another thing that we have to take into consideration. No, not everybody is a leader. Not everybody has understood that we have to protect the environment. So there is another way that we have to take care about. It's the profitability. And for a very long time, the ecologists, the green parties have said, we have to reduce mobility, reduce comfort, reduce growth, reduce consumption and all that, and it doesn't work. On the other hand, you need to convince the industry and the big corporations to be more sustainable. And today there are solutions that are completely profitable. So even if they don't believe in climate change, even if they don't care about the environment, they have an incentive to use these new solutions, these new processes, these new business models, these new technologies, just because they will make more money. Mm -hmm. And this has to be understood today. Protecting the environment is a way to have more growth but not quantitative growth, but qualitative growth, more jobs and more profit. And this has to be understood because it will be like a snowball effect that will bring new players into this wonderful game. 
Mm -hmm. Well said. And indeed, as a futurist, I often speak to audiences around the world, and one of the things that people ask is, can you actually have profit and purpose? Well, I do believe they can go hand of in course, hand. Of course, yes. Of yes. course, yes. And Riel, I want to come to you, because we were talking earlier about some of the new business models that we're seeing. Social entrepreneurship, for instance. I believe you're passionate about what we call the circular economy and the triple bottom line. So tell us more. Um, so, Shavi, I, you know, I really believe that we need to move away from linear economies. We need to embrace the circular economy. Uh, we need to maximize our resources and we, you know, really move to zero waste. Um, so, and I think we need a sustainable economic model for if we have to save this planet and provide for future generations. So, I think, you know, and you see, you see smarter businesses basically adopting this quicker. And if you, as a business, want to secure a place for yourself in the future, your growth curve has to be a sustainable one. Yeah. There is an, we know we live in a resource-constrained world. We know that there's more and more market data to show that consumers are, al are aligning themselves with more responsible brands, right? So you would be foolish to be left behind. Um, so, yeah. And you're seeing that happen from the ground up. It's not just necessarily from the top down. Everyday citizens, future workforces and millennials are very clear that they only want to be aligned with ethical companies more than ever before. Shompi, I want to come to you on this. You have a wealth of experience in different companies from leading Solvay, a chemical company for 15 years, and you're a board member at Airbus and AXA, and obviously chairman of NG. What are some of the visible, but also the invisible elements or drivers that you've seen in action that will actually start to promote this kind of sustainable corporate behavior on a larger scale? Well, I think uh, as leaders of various industries, uh, we are part of an ecosystem which gives us a lot of feedback and a lot of reasons to move in this direction. We talk to customers, we talk to government, we talk to investors, we talk to our own people, and the messages we receive today points to the need of a transformation. When we discuss with customers, we realize that they are facing quite similar challenges. How can they succeed in their tr energy transition without impacting their competitiveness and they're asking for solutions? When we talk to our people, they are waiting for, they are expecting a, a raison d'être, the good reason to get up in the morning and to go to the office, to the lab or to the plant and f be fully engaged. Uh, when we discuss with investors, we start to see, it's probably the category where the transition could, uh, could go a little bit faster, but we receive messages which tell us we have to change. If you are, and you mentioned Airbus, you probably, you've seen in the past months, this campaign started about the shame of flying. I can tell you that this is taken very, very seriously by the aerospace industry. We realize that the people who are on the uh, social media talking about how bad it is uh, to buy a plane ticket and fly to somewhere else, these people will be the customers which will drive the growth of the aerospace industry for the next 20 years. And uh, earlier this week at Le Bourget, you had an interesting panel with uh, two CEOs of Airbus and Boeing and six large equipment suppliers saying, we commit that the growth in uh, air traffic won't lead to an extra carbon emission. It's a first step, hein? we can do much more, but saying that we will completely decouple the growth of the use of aircraft uh, from carbon emission, I think it's a strong message. So, uh, and it started by a social media campaign. So we are, we need, we, we are receiving a lot of small signals which tells us that we need to move. And I think the characteristic of, uh, uh, of these inspired leaders we are talking about are the ability to understand these very small signals and to make big decisions based on them. Thank you for that, and very interesting to get, for example, into the mind of someone like yourself to understand how you're perceiving all the shifts we're seeing in the market as well. Petro, I want to come to you. Do you feel that we absolutely must and can use globalization and all its various mechanisms 
to really act when it comes specifically to do with issues to do with our climate? And how will we get there? No. No. Great. No. Good to know. Because to try to have international consensus is the best way to do nothing. And we see at the COP, climate conferences of the United Nations, you have two levels. One is the people who try to have the international consensus, and it's really hard, and it doesn't move. And then inside the COPs, you have the NGOs, you have the territories, you have the cities, you have corporations, and they work at the very local level to change things. And today we have much more changes on the territorial and local and city level than international. So we have to push local actions. And I'm pushing also a lot the national governments to stop to wait for their neighbors to make a first step and act and be the leaders and do it first. Wow, that was a very positive and rallying call to action. So thank you, I appreciate that. We have a very fascinating question from our audience. It's very, very specific. Jean-Pierre, I will come to you on that because it's specifically about goals for NG. What do you think of purpose-led companies such as B Corp certification? Is this a goal for NG? Well, I think that uh, having the ability to state very clearly a purpose is something which is key for a company today. It's key to clarify our strategic intent. It's key to make sure that we can have the best people working for us. It's key to be able to communicate with customers. So yes, uh, at NG, it's, a point, it's something on which uh, we are currently working on. There is a new law in France, the uh, Loi Pact, which gives this possibility to, uh, uh, to express a purpose. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, we've said it uh, with Isabel at our shareholder meeting uh, a few weeks ago. I'm sure that by our next shareholder meeting in May 2020, we will have clarified what's our purpose. It will be a strong driver to continue the transformation. Okay, thank you for taking that question. I want to now open this up to talking about culture and specifically culture of innovation. So often, when I talk to audiences, I talk about new technologies, and I often say it's very critical when we think about embedding new technologies not to forget about the mindset, right? Because we can't shift that so easily. So what I want to understand from you is, what are some of the mindset shifts and how we think, our psych human psychology, that will be needed in order for companies to then thrive in that setup? Bertrand? We have to understand at first that innovation does not come when you have a new idea. Innovation comes when you get rid of an old belief. Because it's our beliefs, our convictions, our certitudes, our habits that prevent us to see the, the future in a disruptive way. So we just see the future as a continuation of the past instead of saying it disruptive. So if we manage to get rid of all our certitudes and our habits, then we have the mind empty enough, I mean empty enough, to welcome something new. And when we welcome something new, we are in a state where we can really make things completely different. So if we understand that, we see that it's a question of showing the example. Very often we forget that people would be creative if we show the example, if we are interested by other ways to think. If you have an employee who comes to the CEO and says, oh, I have an idea, what do you think? And the CEO says, no way, it doesn't work. You kill the creativity. But if you say, oh, I never thought of that. This goes against my beliefs, which means that I'm really interested to listen to you. The guy, he will come back to his team and say, wow, the CEO is encouraging new ideas, new, new, no, not new ideas, new ways to think, disruptive technologies and so on. And then you will have a very, very innovative right. co company. Oh, I just want to, uh, I just want to comment on what you say, Bertrand. We have a long history together and we've been working exactly. as a partner for several years when I was at Solvay. When Bertrand came, what, 12, 13 years ago saying, I want to fly around the world without a drop of fuel. This was getting rid of an old idea and coming with a new concept. What's interesting is that he first knocked at the door of Airbus, Boeing, Dassault. We say, no, no way. 
he doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, and then he came to a company like Solvay at the time and a few of us, and we say, yes, let's try to do it. We think that we have ideas, technologies, which can contribute to your project. So yes, I think the, uh, the first step of innovation is to stop thinking that something is impossible, but be ready to tackle impressive challenges. And clearly a real life example in action of sectors coming together, people coming together and then making that happen for cohesive action. And indeed some very fascinating endeavors. Ria, I want to come to you. So while we're talking about culture of innovation, do we need to start young? Do we need to actually imbibe this into the education system to then instill those values, for instance, of openness? Because it isn't always taught in schools how to really be receptive to a contrarian view or, for example, to celebrate and champion completely differing opinions. You're taught a little bit more to conform, for instance. So do we need to see perhaps educators work this in as well in building that new workforce and young people? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, we need to be more open-minded. Um, and we've just heard Bertrand talk about, like, the, the leaders and just, you know, embracing that new way of thinking. And I think that's something we need to imbibe in our education system as well and pass on to future generations because they are the future leaders, um, you know. So I think that's important. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it must be part of what we teach our children. And Bertrand, perhaps I will ask you something a bit provocative. What is not working right now in the system when it comes to creating these makers of tomorrow, the inventors and the new entrepreneurs? What's holding us back still? What is not working is the fact that we teach to children and students knowledge, things that are scientifically proven, exclamation marks, convictions, certitudes, instead of teaching them the taste to discover what is not scientifically proven, what does not exist today. We don't teach the trust and the confidence to go into the unknown. We teach only to go into what science has proven. So we are killing the pioneering spirit of the children. So now maybe it's too late to wait 30 years until a new generation with a new education comes in power because in 30 years we'll be in deep trouble. We have to change now, which means that, of course, we have to educate children, but we also have to educate adults. Don't just focus on the next generation. Focus on the people who are leading the world today. Educate the heads of states, the parliamentarians, the CEOs, the chairman of the companies, and like this, you can have a change today and not wait for the next generation to come into power. Jean-Pierre, as a chairman yourself, do you have any thoughts to add to that, perhaps? No, I think it's... Uh, I think it's uh, my two colleagues have said it very clearly. Uh, let's make sure we help these young people to open up their minds. Uh, stop thinking that something is impossible, but on the contrary, be willing to make the next step. But looking at what's happening around the world, including uh, the fact that we see now uh, every Friday in Europe, large number of uh, young people expressing their support for more breakthrough policy regarding climate, all of this is quite encouraging. Yes. Now we but have an know, interesting... Sorry, you, go on. You know why it's so important to believe that we can achieve the impossible? Because when we want to achieve something that is considered to be impossible, the people that, you, that will join you will be very creative people. They will be very performant people, people completely dedicated and devoted to the goal. If you have a low-level goal, the people who will join you will be lazy people, people who don't have creativity. They will say, oh, that's a low-level goal, it's easy, I can have a, 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 an easy life. And, and the value of the company will decrease. So the more ambitious goals you have, the higher will be the quality of your teams. Mm -hmm. And Ria, coming to you. So you're running EcoWare, right, in India, and it's been a decade now. How do we reconcile, for instance, what Bertrand has just said about being very ambitious with your goals and surrounding yourself with ambitious, creative people who will do that with you? Because you've obviously set that up on very been very ambitious and creative yourself. How has that journey been for you from concept to delivery? It's, 
It's been quite an exciting one. <laughs> um, no, I mean, we've, you know, we've had our fair set of challenges and we still do. Uh, you know, we're still uh, want to grow and, 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 and see what more it is that we can do and keep innovating. So um, I think, you know, what I touched upon this morning is just very simply, it's like to keep reminding yourself of that impact that you want to, that I set out and, you know, I committed that I wanted to create 10 years ago about, be it health, environmental, social. Um, and that's what keeps me going and, and driven. And um, no matter what comes our way or business decisions that we have to make, we kind of bring our thoughts back onto that because mm -hmm. that's our core. Yes. And just say, okay, does this allow us to do and achieve these goals? And if it does, okay, what's next and what do we have to do, basically? And Ria, for those that weren't here this morning, could you describe to us what EcoWare actually does? Um, so the idea of, finding eco, of founding EcoWare 10 years ago was to displace single-use plastic. Uh, we wanted to find a healthier solution for the environment and uh, something that was also safe to eat out of because we know that when you put hot food in a plastic plate, the plastic melts, it leaches toxins into the food, which you then consume, and then that leads to disease. So uh, what we do at EcoWare is very simple. We use crop waste, so uh, typically wheat, rice, sugarcane. Uh, we're now exploring even paddy straw. We take the leftover crop, uh, the, le the waste, once the crop has been processed, and we turn it into tableware, which is 100% compostable. Wonderful. Now, I want to actually start drawing this to a close, but I want to propose a question that's been on my mind as we've been talking. In all of this, the common thread that comes across is dialogue, transmission, and alliance. Without that, personally, I believe we're dead in the water, right? So, given that we have, for example, the diversity of backgrounds on this stage itself. My final question for each of you is a meaningful one. What is it going to take for us to see more realistic alliances between business, government, society, academia, the startup sector, for instance, right? And how are we going to get there in the next, let me say, five years? Bertrand, I'll come to you first. Yeah, we have to fight against inertia, selfishness, laziness, short-termism, fear of the unknown, fear of change. And who can help us for that? I believe it's the regulation. Excuse me to say that because very often people want less regulation. So I'm not saying we need more. I'm saying we need modern regulations. Today it is allowed, legally allowed, to put as much CO2 as you want in the atmosphere. It is legally allowed to waste as much energy and natural resources as you want. So we need regulations that will put everybody at the same level. Because it's not fair that a corporation who has a real leader is handicapped in the competitivity against other companies who are not playing the same game. So it's very important to have these regulations that allow to stop the distortion of competitivity, allow everyone to play on a fair game. Who is going to do that? We have the help of children in the street on the Friday that gives a justification to the governments to act. That's good, the governments can say, the children are asking us to do something, so we're obliged to do it. So it's very useful. But there's another thing that is extremely important. It is that the CEOs and chairmen of big corporations go on their own to the governments and say we need a clear regulation that shows in which way we have to invest, which are the direction, how are the externalities going to be included, what will be the carbon policy in the future, what will be the energy efficient policy in the future, and ask for something ambitious. If we have these regulations, it's going to be extremely easy and smooth because all the solutions that exist, and I tell you there are thousands of solutions existing everywhere, everywhere, they're going to be pulled by the necessity to the market. And we're going to have startups who are going to flourish, we're going to have much more job creation and much more profit and much more growth, much more economical growth. Imagine we have to replace all the dirty and inefficient infrastructure 
by modern and efficient infrastructure. It's the market of the century. But it will not happen if the regulation is not helping the companies to all go in the same direction. Right, so regulation as a strong enabler to Absolutely. allow us to actually funnel some of that. Jean-Pierre. Well, maybe I'm a bit less of a fan of regulation, although I recognize that there are necessary in a number of areas. Uh, I like the way you frame the question. I think this is clearly, uh, this is clearly the uh, uh, key issue that we need to solve. First, dialogue. We need dialogue. It's improving very much. Huh? The big difference at the Paris COP was the fact that business was not there uh, worried about the outcome of the COP. Business was interacting uh, with negotiators and decision makers. So dialogue is there, but we need to reinforce this dialogue and this ability from the municipality to the uh, large country's government. We need a dialogue between economic forces and, uh, and political decision makers. Clear objectives. The good thing about the Paris Agreement is that it states a clear objective. Uh, then we need visibility on how we should act. Uh, and there is when regulation takes into account. The difficulty about regulation is that uh, we have a tendency to pile regulation on top of each other. And regulation wants to achieve a lot of different things. It doesn't help prioritize. Uh, but yes, if we tell to the business forces, this is the objective, this is the framework in which we can act, a lot can be done. But the good news, and um, as I told you at the beginning, I think we need to be optimistic if we want to have all the energy we need to tackle all these challenges. I think it's improving. I think it's happening just not as fast as it should, not as deeply or broadly as it should, but the world is changing, and I think that companies are part of this transformation. And it's happening now, the future is now. And it's happening now. now here, and again, what we've been, hopefully what we've been able to share with you at this good day here in Paris, showing, showcasing all the energy capabilities, is to demonstrate that the business has indeed the ability and the willingness to contribute. Wonderful. That was very inspirational. Ria, I see you nodding along. Any final words from you? So I think alliance is important. I do agree with both the gentlemen. Um, my only you know, takeaway point from this is you don't need to wait for it. You don't need to wait for regulation. You don't need to wait for a framework. You know you need to change your ways as an individual and as a business leader. So go out and do it. And do it now. Simple. Exactly. I mean, we built EcoWare without any regulation whatsoever. So, you know, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from going out, engaging with your community, with your business, and encouraging change in behavior. Well, thank you, all three of you, for those very positive words. Clearly, the theme that kind of unifies all of us is good business for common good. And that's a very heartening message in the midst of so much negativity we see in the media. So good to take that away. Please, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for our panel. Now we will take a quick 15-minute break and we will come back